Hi, everybody. Uh, it's 5.30 uh, and I'm Carol Willis. I'm the director of the Skyscraper Museum and I'm delighted to welcome you tonight to uh, a roundup and a round table that will, um, if not conclude the discussion of con the construction history work in progress that we've undertaken in these last five weeks uh, of a seminar that has been led by Tom Leslie and Donald Friedman uh, and all of the participants in this series and this semester of, uh, of consideration of construction history have joined us tonight for uh, a discussion, a, a discussion that'll be framed by uh, Joanna Merwood Salisbury, by me, by Tom and Tom Leslie and, and Don Friedman. Uh, and then we're going to be joined kind of as the moderator for the question period by Alexander Wood who has uh, given his own talk, a kind of case study on the Mills building in our series and has joined in this kind of continuing consideration that um, has been on screen and off screen for us. And we've had quite a lot of fun in our, our pre-calls and our, our sessions of, uh, of you know, uh, kind of getting into the weeds of historiography. And we wanted to use that discussion to frame um, tonight's um, kind of summary consideration, but also a, a kind of clarification of some of the motivating premises of uh, this, we scholars who have long studied um, the subject of the skyscraper and the, the narratives um, that we grew up in, the ones we resisted uh, as revisionist historians, uh, and then to consider some of these framing methods of thinking about change and how change happens. So this discussion may be um, much the same, but in some ways different than the five previous discussions, because we've been thinking amongst ourselves what it is that we wanted to communicate about why we have undertaken this, this study, um, the broad study and not just the series tonight. So um, you're joining us for this last round table, as you can see in the slide of construction history. And uh, this is part of the series of work in progress that took five topics, foundations, frames, facades, and fire, where Tom and Don um, considered in, this, in a paired discussion um, the differences between the two cities of New York and Chicago. And then tonight we will all, all also search for the commonalities. Uh, this is an investigation that continues uh, some of our earlier discussions when we were uh, as, um, as either participants or, or scholars in a symposium that was held in Chicago a few years ago by the CTBUH that I've, the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat that I've mentioned a few times um, because it was the catalyst for the reaction uh, uh, against the idea of the first skyscraper, something that we've all been against for a long time, but it seemed necessary to rebut that in a considered um, program. So uh, skys first skyscrapers, we think don't exist, but skyscraper first, yes, there are some um, first in technology that we can discuss and that we have discussed. Um, here are the co-conspirators um, on, on screen as they were in Chicago. You see Tom and Don, familiar, and you can also see Gail Fenske and, and Jerry Larson, who were also part of this, as, as was Joanna um, in from, by the way, New Zealand uh, tonight, uh, but she participated in this program as well. So the, one of the questions that we wanted uh, to revise was not what was the first skyscraper, but when were the first skyscrapers and why then? What was it particular about either the 1870s or the 1880s? And that's where we began um, this series, uh, mostly situated in the 1880s. We were also um, reacting um, against the the uh, narrative of the first Chicago school that is, is much propounded in multiple books by Carl Condit, the kind of king of, of Chicago in the mid 20th century uh, generation of historians. Uh, and so here are a new generation of historians, Don Friedman, Tom Leslie, Joanna Merwood, and I'm gonna show you the covers of their books um, again, uh, because it's always good to promote their books. And here's Joanna's, which you've seen maybe once, once or twice so far, Chicago, 1980. 
uh, that looks at the skyscraper and the modern city, so at modernity and in the urban context of the skyscraper. Uh, Joanna is also in her framing introduction after I get off the screen going to talk a little bit more about the modernist project of not just the Museum of Modern Art, but indeed the European modernist, the international style. Um, and she will talk about that, uh, the paradigmatic building of that lineage uh, is uh, the architect is Mies van der Rohe, and in the case we use the example of the Seagram building here in New York, but in any case, the structural rationalism um, as a part of the definition of modernity. Now, I just wanted to show, well, not so much uh, my book, but the idea that drove uh, my book, Form Follows Finance, some more than 25 years ago, it was published in 1995, uh, was the urban context of the skyscraper in the commercial context, and that has not been the subject. Uh, for this series. We wanted to look at construction history, which is a badly neglected area of the history of architecture. Uh, but I just wanted to bring back into the discussion this revisionist view um, that I uh, you know, advanced in the 1990s, which was against the prevailing history narratives, um, a, a focus on American modernism um, on, um, on especially European modernism as the valid idea of modernist ideology. Um, and instead I turned to the city, um, to land values, to economics, to municipal regulations, all of which have figured in our discussion of um, architectural design uh, and construction in the decades that we've been looking at in this series. And these are re recurring motifs. Um, we, have all, especially um, Tom, Don, and I credited, well, all of us uh, credited um, the great book by William Cronin on uh, Nature's Metropolis, Chicago, Chicago in the Great West, uh, as, um, as a, a history which is extraordinarily complex, but also clear. And if we call it something, we might call it environmental history because it's urban <laughs> history, it's the, city of, uh, the history of a city, um, but it's connections to its hinterlands um, and as a kind of condenser and, and central centralizer of materials, but then also with the kind of tentacles that go, off, uh, go across the continent. So to look at this very broad context, which is very similar uh, um, to what uh, Tom Leslie applied in his methodology um, throughout his four lectures. So um, I did want to show the book cover of Brian Bowen's book on the American construction industry, uh, which uh, um, shows him to be you know, a, a, a wide ranging and, and thoughtful historian of not just the sky, not the skyscrapers specifically, but the construction history in general. And he um, comes as a practitioner uh, to the, the discussion. Uh, as well as a teacher. And then we're also going to be joined tonight, uh, in addition to Alex Wall by Jared Green, uh, who uh, is also a practitioner, uh, a practicing uh, founda uh, foundation engineer. So geotechnical engineer. So um, these are the names of the people who will be um, speaking and on the panel tonight. I'll pop in and out um, of the discussion, uh, but we'll keep them on the screen once we go into dialogue. But before that, Joanna is going to share her screen and do a, a little more background on historiography. Um, then Don uh, Friedman will speak next, uh, and then Tom Leslie, and then the discussion amongst us all. So um, Joanna, I'm handing it over to you now. Thank you, Carol. Um, first of all, just making sure you can see my screen. Carol, let me know if you yes. cannot. You can? Great. Okay. Um, well, thanks very much. And I do want to start off by saying thank you uh, to you, Carol, and to the staff at the Skyscraper Museum for organizing this symposium. Um, of course, to Tom Leslie and Don Friedman and Alexander Wood um, for their very insightful presentations. And to the respondents, Jared and Brian, for bringing their own perspectives um, and expertise to the topic at hand. And the topic, of course, is what John Wellborn Root called in 1890, the great architectural problem, that is the design of the tall office building. Um, part of the challenge, and I think the attraction of the topic, looking at the history of this type, is the great symbolic value that it holds. 
if we think of the combined cultural meanings that have accrued around it uh, since the turn of the 20th century, we can recall very diverse representations made of it um, from paintings like this one um, of the sunlit Woolworth building in which it symbolizes American progress and even exceptionalism to European photography, uh, particularly the work of the avant-garde like Eric Mendelssohn, where uh, the skyscraper, in this case, the unnamed uh, Monadnock building, represents the international potential of an industrial future. So two very different ideas about what the skyscraper represents, a, a national symbol and a symbol of an international future. So taking all of that, uh, uh, in, in perspective, the great weight of the symbolic value explains, I think, the long-standing desire to identify the first skyscraper. If we can find the first of the type, we can definitively claim it as original and distinctive, untainted by precedent. Uh, on the one hand, a truly American invention, and on the other, the manifestation of the great forces of industry that have the potential for universal emancipation. So uh, these are the great, um, this is a great challenge that Tom and Don uh, took by the horns, uh, challenging these strong cultural imperatives. Um, they focused on the real basis of its development in uh, Chicago and New York, including in particular discussion of the metal cage construction, metal frame design, a system that was, um, as Tom always reminds us, only for a brief period, the state of the art in skyscraper design, supposedly premiered in the home insurance building, famously um, this was exposed uh, in 1931 when the building was demolished. Um, uh, the report was written um, under the direction of Thomas Talmadge, claiming that the, the deconstruction of the building proved its primacy, an idea that uh, has since been, um, since been um, challenged uh, by many scholars. So of particular interest in Tom and Don's talks, um, for me anyway, has been the very opaque definition of what we mean by the steel framed skyscraper, including how it differed from what came before uh, constructions like steel, uh, excuse me, um, truss bridges uh, designed by rail companies and shot towers such as the one here in New York and how it differed from what came after including the reinforced concrete frame building uh, represented here by the Everett building in Union Square which very quickly replaced the steel frame skyscraper in both cities. I think we'll hear more about this um, in their presentations, but um, evolution is an analogy, an analogy that architects and engineers use to describe the process of technological development in the late 19th century. And it continues to serve a useful purpose um, as we'll hear later, although the terms in which we use it um, have changed. Bound up in the history of the skyscraper is another myth, which is this urban rivalry, the question of which city invented the type and which city's style best expressed its nature, Chicago or New York. And the first city and second city narrative remains a compelling one, strong enough, in fact, to even structure this symposium series, even as we question this binary as rather simplistic. In the early 20th century, uh, architectural historians and um, popular critics often ascribed the differences in skyscraper form in the two cities to what I'm going to call metropolitan psychology or temperament. Um, you've probably all heard the claim that New York housed the headquarters of large companies while Chicago housed branch offices. And this rather um, glib and perhaps untrue observation has been used frequently to explain the differing aesthetic schemes at play, more ornamental in New York and plainer in Chicago. Though, of course, um, it's not difficult to find Chicago examples that are just as exuberant and eclectic as those found in New York, for example, Boynton's 
Columbus Memorial Building. So this is a, <clears throat> one of the myths that's actually very easy to disprove. We can probably trace its origins back to uh, Chicago architects themselves who built a narrative through their publications that they were um, privileged because they were living on the frontier in the American West, uh, more removed from European influence and less constrained by aesthetic convention than their New York peers. I think a lot of scholars have done some work to unpack uh, the ways in which that narrative was constructed. Putting aside questions of cultural representation and urban psychology, uh, Tom and Don have acted as construction detectives, experts in structural forensic analysis, looking at the real geological, technological and regulatory differences that explain um, the difference in skyscraper form in these two cities. Some are very well known, such as the different ground conditions of Chicago and New York resting on uh, clay and bedrock respectively. Um, and here you see the Woolworth building under construction. Um, and others such as differing building laws and codes con controlling construction are less recognized, although they have had substantial impact on skyscraper form. So while we'll never resolve this question of the first skyscraper, um, there's no, in, no doubt that it uh, is a period of immense change uh, in American uh, history, in world history, and also in the nature of building practice. And this was the topic of the final lecture in the series um, in which Alexander Wood spoke about George Post's Mills building of 1882. His focus was on the transformation of the business of building that accompanied the rise of the skyscraper. In the short span of history that this series covers, um, illustrated by these two images from 1882 and 1911, the practices of architecture, engineering and construction underwent enormous changes. Um, and we've talked a little bit in our pre-call uh, uh, about the division of the professions of architecture and engineering into separate spheres. Uh, following on from Carol's work, Alexander makes the point that technological change doesn't happen without economic demand. And thinking of skyscrapers uh, from this perspective revises modernist histories that put so much emphasis on architects as heroic individuals, Burnham and Jenny, etc. Alex uh, suggests that we should instead look at agents of change, professionals like um, Chicago's William Ellery Hale, who developed new technologies, the uh, elevator, and the landowners and developers who sought out experimental buildings as machines to make the land pay in the famous words of Cass Gilbert. So that's a kind of um, summary of the various mythologies that the symposium series has been challenging very successfully, I think. Um, and now I'm going to stop sharing and pass over to Don, who's going to dig into the uh, history of skyscraper technology. Thank you, Joanna. Um, so as, a, as an engineer, it's perhaps inevitable that when I started um, studying history, uh, which I did somewhat after college, uh, that I was going to look at the history of technology, which is, you know, all, all history is related. The history of technology is distinct from, but touches on the history of architecture at a number of points. Um, and, and I've been trying to specifically use that perspective uh, in the question we've been discussing in these, in these lectures, the, the um, development of early skyscrapers, first skyscrapers, if you, if you want to use that, that phrase. Um, when you look at it, from a technological standpoint, the individual buildings simply are not, they're not the focus. It's not that they're unimportant because they each represent a moment in technological development. Um, it's, but what, what I've always focused on is the underlying technologies that are used to, that were used to, to design and build those buildings. Um, so I, I wanna sort of go through a couple of different views of that uh, in the, the rather brief time I have today. Um, this is uh, an example of, from 1891, William Fryer was, was describing technological evolution. He didn't use that phrase, um, but, that, but if you look at those three diagrams on the left, what he's showing 
um, is three stages of development of a metal frame building uh, where the in the one on the top, the uh, the wall is completely independent of the metal frame. The metal frame is only supporting the floors. Um, and then the architect got clever and pushed the, the column outboard uh, so that it wasn't taking up more floor space, um, but it was still not really supporting any masonry. It was just embedded in the masonry. And then the, the picture on the bottom, he's showing you where the column is now within the, the wall completely so that it can serve as a structural support for the wall. And then he also included the, uh, the axonometric picture on the right showing what that last stage would look like. Except from our perspective, he's showing cast iron columns. So this is, this is still very old fashioned um, from, from, our, from the way we see it. From the way Fryer saw it in 1891, in 1891, there were three steel skeleton frame buildings in the entire United States. Cast iron columns were far more common. So he was showing what actual buildings looked like to him. But, you know, this is just, this is uh, an architect and engineer, which is what he was. This is a man drawing some pictures. Does this represent reality? Um, and I need to make sure that I'm advancing my slides. Uh, this is the north side of Union Square, um, the office building of the Jackson Ironworks. This was not the Ironworks. They, they, they were in less valuable land. Uh, but it's the entire, it's, it's a big slab building. There's a small light court on the right side. So um, let me see if I can mark this up. That's all the Jackson building. It ran clear through the block. So it was 200 feet long in one direction and obviously very narrow, uh, a slab skyscraper form as opposed to a tower. Um, that, that's just so you can see what it looked like. But the floor plan tells you that uh, there's Friar's column embedded in the wall. Um, and so he was, and, and this, this is a building from 1892, the year after Friar drew those diagrams. So this, he was describing the building technology that he was seeing around him at that time. And in this case, that building technology was used to build a, uh, a, an office building with a slenderness of 6.7. Uh, which is to say it was almost seven times as tall as it was wide east to west, uh, which is the kind of thing that you can't really do with a bearing wall building. So this, as primitive as this building is structurally from our perspective now, at that time it was advanced or reasonably advanced. Um, it had cast iron columns and from the way we look at it, no real lateral load resistance in the east-west direction. If the wind was blowing from the top of the, the slide towards the bottom, um, this building really didn't have structure that could resist that, uh, which seems like a big omission to us. Um, one of the, the sort of the perfect encapsulations I came across doing the research uh, was the obituary for um, Samuel Weisskopf, who was one of the first uh, engineers to found a structural consulting firm for buildings in the United States. Uh, and something of a coincidence, I worked for that firm as my, my first job as an engineer. And in his obituary uh, from, I, th I think it was the 1920s, uh, maybe the 30s, um, it, it said that he was one of the first engineers to design skyscrapers uh, that could resist wind. It, um, and when you say that, what you're, what you're implying and what was true is that people had been building skyscrapers before that that didn't have structure that was designed to resist wind. So there again is, is sort of the next stage in evolution beyond Fryer's diagrams. So these few slides have given you sort of a, a gradual evolution view of things. I need to move on to my next slide if I can. There we go. Um, this is uh, the city investing building, city investing building, excuse me, um, under construction. Uh, this is a steel skeleton frame, and you can see that frame. It, this photograph shows the, uh, the public face of steel skeleton framing, which is that the facade is beginning in midair, um, that you didn't have to build the masonry wall from the, the ground up because the masonry wall is supported by the frame. So you have this, this sort of, from the perspective of people at that time, this bizarre appearance of a masonry wall floating in midair. Um, the thing about this is that this is, this is a building, the Jackson Ironworks office was a building. Functionally, architecturally, there's a lot in common. Structurally, it's not that similar uh, as a system, as a skeleton frame system. 
And one of the questions that, that has to be answered is how does that evolution work? How do you get from the, uh, the cast iron column frame that can't resist wind to this steel skeleton frame that can? And um, I want to get out of this evening's discussion alive, so I am not going to suggest that this is the first skyscraper. Uh, but this is the, uh, the 1889 Cairo Bridge, excuse me, Cairo Bridge uh, in Southern Illinois. Uh, built for the Illinois Central Railroad. And the steel structure of this bridge, which was built before there was a steel skeleton building in the United States or anywhere, really, um, the steel structure of this bridge is far more complex uh, than any skyscraper that was built really until the mid-1890s. For, for a few years, this steelwork is much more than people were putting into buildings. Um, that this represents some 30 years of development of truss bridges by railroads in the United States. Um, and when I say development, that's development of uh, the steel material, development of um, design methods among engineers, development of a group of engineers who knew how to, how to design a structure like this, which had to be designed for wind load and for very heavy gravity loads, um, because there was a long history of such bridges collapsing when they weren't properly designed. Uh, and and development of the connections between pieces of steel. How do you how do you connect two pieces of steel, which was a actually a much more complicated issue than um, connecting a steel beam to a cast iron column, where you basically just sat the steel on a shelf that was uh, part of the cast iron. So this is in some ways a progenitor of the uh, the steel skeleton frame buildings that came literally the, starting the year after this bridge was completed. Um, my last slide is going to take a couple of minutes to describe. I've used a, a similar slide before. I actually made this one a little more complicated because I felt it wasn't complicated enough. Um, but this is really the, the history of technology view of a question like this. Um, looking at an individual building gives you a specific example, but it does not give you very much information about where that example came from. What was its background? What does it represent? Uh, whereas an analysis like this, which is sort of a, a combat, this is basically an economic analysis, um, does give you more information about what was going on uh, in the last 20 or 30 years of the 19th century. Most important thing about this slide, about this chart, is that all of the things I'm looking at here are, are indexes where I'm looking only at the percentage change. And I had to do this because the numbers vary so much. Um, one of the lines represents uh, Chicago's population. Well, Chicago's population in 1870 was 300,000 people. Um, brick production on this slide is measured in the billions. So if you don't turn them into percentages, you can't compare them at all. Um, looking at the, the three lines representing population, uh, and I hope you can see my cursor, US population is the, the light blue line second from the bottom. New York City's population is the light green line right above that. Chicago's population is the gray line, gray line that is second from the top. Um, Chicago's population grows more than fivefold in that 30 years. Uh, New York's more than doubles. The U.S. doesn't. The U.S. population doesn't quite double. Um, this is a case where using percentages is a little bit misleading. New York's population is larger than Chicago's at every point on this chart. Um, Chicago's population was starting in 1870 from a much smaller, uh, a much smaller base point, but. The thing to note, both New York, which was in this entire 30 year period already the largest city in the country, is still growing faster than the US population is as a whole. So these are two cities that are that are growing very rapidly. Um, just a, a minor technical issue in case anybody's wondering, I'm looking at the population within the uh, city's corporate boundaries, and those did expand over time. Um, New York swallowed first the Bronx and then in 1898, uh, Brooklyn, Queens and Staten Island. Um, Chicago was growing uh, by swallowing nearby towns as well. Getting to st stuff that's perhaps more interesting, but I do need to come back to the population now and again. Uh, right here in the middle, we've got, oh, sorry, um, down at the very bottom, we've got uh, new building permits issued. That is official government recognition of new buildings. And as you note, there's, there's no real clear trend here. Uh, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down again. Um, despite the fact that, that uh, the country's population almost doubles, there's not a clear trend to new building permits. However, if you look at the value of new construction, which is this red line in the middle, uh, 
um, it tr more than triples. So buildings are either getting bigger or more expensive, which means uh, more complex, or both. Looking at some building materials, um, so general manufacturing production, that's everything. That includes manufacturing you know, fountain pens. That grows fourfold in this period. The US is going through a huge industrial boom in the late 19th century. Uh, Produce, by the way, I should, again, output, that's what's produced as opposed to what is used or sold. Not exactly the same thing, but they're pretty similar. Um, the production of brick, on the other hand, common and face brick manufactured. So it, that common and face brick is to exclude things like refractory brick that, was, that would be used uh, in a fireplace. Um, common and face brick grows, uh, it, it, it triples overall, but it actually decreases between 1890 and 1900. The, the, starting around 1890, um, the production of brick stops growing. And that's sort of an interesting question. Why is that happening? Um, the production of structural iron and steel, which is this line shooting up to the top. The reason that starts in 1880 is that the amount is that that is um, steel as a for construction as opposed to steel that might be used uh, for railroads. And the reason it doesn't that line starts in 1880 is that the amount in 1870 was considered to be too small to separate from the railroad iron and steel. Uh, as so between 1880 and 1900, 20 years, uh, it increases over nine times. Um, and then the last thing on here is that the miles of railroad track, which is right below Chicago population, uh, and grows fivefold, much faster than population, faster than the industrial output of the country, um, People are traveling more, goods are traveling more, and the rail network of the country is getting denser. Why, why do I care about that as somebody looking at skyscrapers? Because every one of those lines of railroad required bridges. And the more th that people built railroad, the more engineers there were building truss bridges, the more experience there was in building bridges. So this chart does not in itself prove anything, but if I'm trying to construct a narrative as to where the expertise came to build that, that to build the city investing building, that complicated uh, steel frame in the building, um, and looking at, for example, uh, the engineers who were designing most of the buildings in the late 19th century, quite a few of them had backgrounds working for railroads or working for companies like American Bridge, uh, which designed bridges for railroads. So. My, my general take on this is if you want to understand where the technology in buildings was coming from, you have to look, do this kind of analysis where you see, um, you know, what was going on in the context. Uh, the, the, for me, the most interesting line on this graph is the, the production of brick dropping, um, despite the fact that people were building more and more buildings, um, they weren't using as much brick. And one of the explanations for that is that they were starting to use metal structure uh, to support load rather than brick walls. Um, and now that I've beaten that into the ground, I'm going to let Tom rebut me. No, no rebuttal here. Uh, just a, a kind of um, expansion, maybe. And Don, you get full points today for correct pronunciation of Cairo, Illinois. Um, we'll have to bring Verbonus, Illinois, into the into the picture at some point. Um, so I, I want to touch on uh, something that uh, Joanna brought up and that, that we've been discussing offline the last week. And, and that is to think about the kind of model that we use to, to talk about uh, skyscraper history. And even the, the kind of technological history that Don has suggested, I think can be sort of deepened or enriched or productively complicated. Uh, by taking seriously this idea that this is a, an evolutionary process and thinking about what that means. I think one of the things that I've taken away from our discussions uh, is that uh, there, are, it, it, there are these uh, structures that are, we think of sometimes as proto skyscrapers or hybrids. This is the Monadnock building, which we always think of as a brick building, uh, but which I, I like to always point out is really a steel building trapped inside a, a brick uh, exterior, very much a hybrid looking at kind of two technologies that are, that are kind of intersecting. And one of the things that I think um, has motivated all of us is the idea that the, the kind of first skyscraper story, especially about the home insurance, is just a little too pat, right? That it doesn't really reflect the complexity that, that's actually going on as people are, th are thinking about how to achieve these buildings. The home insurance too is a hybrid building. I think that's one of the things that 
usually gets it dinged by those of us who uh, like to, to uh, sort of tilt at, at historic windmills. Uh, the fact that it uses brick not only for its wind bracing, but for a lot of its gravity structure, uh, in some ways disqualifies it as a first skyscraper, right? Because it, it isn't a pure steel or iron frame. But I wanna argue that it makes it a, a richer example and one that's actually worth kind of diving into, not as a first, but as an example of how the technology is evolving and how quickly uh, it's evolving. And to do that, I wanna just very quickly bring up the idea of speciation in evolutionary biology. What, what do evolutionary biologists look for uh, to, to, to decide when a, a new species has emerged? And the classic example of this is Darwin's finches where uh, a, a population in one part of the island goes after one kind of bug and its beak needs to be a, a slightly different shape uh, to get at that bug more efficiently. And uh, eventually through natural selection, the beaks grow in slightly different ways. And at a crucial moment, one population decides or is unable to mate with the other population, right? Whether it's because that group's beaks like just look too weird or because there's actually kind of genetic incompatibility. And what uh, biologists call reproductive isolation, I think is a nice kind of metaphor for beginning to see skyscrapers emerge as their own thing. I, I think what this suggests is that we think about skyscrapers not as a series of isolated events, but as a continuum, just like biologists think of uh, species as a continuum, and that we think of it as branching as in this famous sketch of, of Darwin's where there are hundreds of different potential paths we have the advantage that we can think and we can model and we can decide what's likely to work and what, what, what might not. So our paths are probably less complex, but even Darwin's sketch today, an evolutionary biologist looking at that would say it's a little too pat, that it's actually much kind of blurrier than that. And that blur is where this sort of interesting stuff really comes in. So I suggest that maybe we go back and look not only at buildings like the home insurance that clearly aren't a first skyscraper, but then we go back further and start to ask ourselves, what is it about some of these very early, what we might call proto skyscrapers uh, that makes them uh, kind of not yet speciated into actual skyscrapers? So here are three examples, uh, all from Chicago, uh, Portland Block by Jenny in 1872, Borden by Adler and Sullivan in 1880, Montauk by Burnham in 1882. Uh, none of these, I think, would we think of as genuine skyscrapers. Montauk, maybe because it hits 10 stories. But to me, the really interesting thing, and, and one thing that Don has brought up uh, about expertise is that all of these are done, when they're done, they're done basically by firms that are still thought of as residential architects or kind of all purpose architects. It's a weird thing to do a big commercial block. There are only so many architects. Most of them are busy with houses. You hire one of them and they have to think very hard about how they're gonna tackle this kind of new problem. It's only when these firms start to begin to be called skyscraper architects or start to think of themselves as these sort of places of expertise that we start to see skyscrapers really emerge. The other way I wanna look at this is through language and how, for instance, we only really kind of look at uh, new species emerging backwards. So we're only able to look through history and say, oh, that starts to look like a fish right about there in the fossil record. And I love bringing up the fact that the term skyscraper was used in the 1860s and 1870s, both for women's fashion, uh, for baseball, uh, and only in 1889, at least in the Chicago press, do we see it begin to describe buildings. And this to me is a little bit like the recognition that, oh, hey, here in the fossil record, there is emerging something that looks like a distinct species, right? Something new and different. And that didn't necessarily happen in nature, right? Nature doesn't care whether we think of it as a new species or not. It happens subjectively. It happens when we look at it and try to categorize things very much as, as, we, uh, as we've done uh, in, in, in this series. So here are the three buildings that the Tribune calls skyscrapers in 1889. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce is under construction, but it qualifies. Looking now with our kind of uh, backward focus, we can look at these three and say, oh yeah, those seem to be skyscrapers where those earlier ones were kind of clearly not. But they're really just a kind of extension of some of the same technologies, some of the same forms, uh, and really just sort of pushing the, the, the height limits just a little bit higher until suddenly somehow, just like a finch's beak that suddenly becomes, that suddenly makes it a new species, we suddenly have this new type, right? The, 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 the skyscraper, the, the urban tall building. 
we can look at how people use the term and, and how it took off. You can see here, this is Google Books great uh, tool, the Ngram, which is uh, not necessarily reliable, but often surprisingly accurate in terms of confirming what we may already think. And here you can see that that term skyscraper really takes off in the 1890s, that that is when uh, sort of looking around and seeing this new generation of sort of taller, uh, more technologically advanced buildings, writers, newspaper, uh, uh, newspaper writers, authors uh, begin to look around and say, there seems to be a new type, right? a new species of building here. And as you can see, that ebbs and flows uh, throughout, the, throughout the teens and 20s. So just to sort of put my cards on the table, I think that we can think about evolution as a model. We have to be careful to distinguish because it's not exactly the same. There is competition that is the kind of motivating factor uh, in the natural world, a competition for resources in the design world, usually market competition. Uh, the mechanisms are very, very different in natural selection. They re, re, natural selection relies on thousands and millions of random mutations that every so often will improve odds for reproduction and pass those genes along. We're very lucky in that we can think things through and we can actually kind of apply some intelligence, uh, some modeling behavior to, to think about what might actually work better. Natural world has time on its side. Thousands of generations means trillions of possible mutations. We have that feedback loop where we can look around and say, that seems to work, that didn't work. I have an idea about how we can do that slightly better. And then finally, what causes change or what causes the, the, the process to move along in natural selection, it's changes in the environment, predator or prey populations, changes in the climate, et cetera. And in architecture and engineering, I would argue that it's both new materials, new things that come online that we can use but also the kind of surrounding environments, the legislative environment, the economic environment, sometimes even the political or sociocultural uh, environments. In the natural world, that manifests itself in critters that find these ecological niches, whether it's using dissolved silica to make microscopic uh, shells and radiolarians, uh, prehensile tongues that can grab uh, insects that other uh, frog species can't in this tree frog, or uh, a, an animal that evolves to reach a, a sort of higher plane of, of nutrients than anything else uh, on the savanna can get. We think about that applied instead to buildings. We have here three buildings that are uh, occupying what I might call material niches. Uh, one that looks at an era of relatively cheap, uh, good structural brick uh, and a need for daylight. Another that takes advantage of steel and terracotta uh, to do the same thing. And then 30 years later, a building that uh, has much better steel connections and much less need uh, for daylight, all finding appropriate economic uh, or, or material niches. And finally, just to conclude, I think that the, I, I would argue that instead of kind of worrying about the ambiguity of all this, we ought to actually kind of celebrate it. Uh, one of the, th the sort of um, straw men that I enjoy knocking down is Louis Sullivan's famous aphorism, right? That form follows function. And I like pointing out that uh, his partner, Dankmar Adler, took him to task for that. And in a, a speech to the AIA in 1896, said that Sullivan's aphorism didn't quite work, that the materials complicated things. And the changing palette that those two had had over their careers led to radically different uh, buildings that exploited new materials or new kind of balances between desired function and available resources in ways that gave even their own work a sort of incredible variety. So that, I, the idea of not kind of natural selection, but uh, maybe sort of uh, technological selection or, or maybe uh, uh, engineering selection uh, is an idea that I'd want to throw out, not to kind of eliminate the, uh, the complexity, but instead to find a way to sort of get our arms around it uh, and to make that, I think, into, into part of the story about, about these buildings we've been looking at. So I will uh, call, I will, um, finish that off and return us to uh, the, the, the discussion where hopefully we've got uh, questions and answers that we can, um, we can use to fuel our further conversation. Great, thank you, Tom, and, and everybody else come onto the screen and we'll get organized through the discussion and we'll ask um, Alexander Wood to take over and begin to ask some of the questions of the speakers and uh, of all of us. Uh, we still have uh, Joanna to come onto the screen and also Jared Green and Brian Bowen. There's Jared 
and Brian has just joined us. And, be, and so the six, the six of you have more real estate. I'm going to turn my camera off um, and I may pop in um, on occasion to pose a question. All right, thank you, Carol. And thank you, Joanna and Don and Tom uh, for your presentations and um, your earlier lectures in the series. Um, I'd like to start with a comment that Joanna made in her introduction in which you discussed the early scholarship on the skyscraper, which was written in the heyday of modernism. You mentioned that a lot of this early work um, like Gideon, maybe you're thinking of Condent, uh, was sort of a celebration of an individual, of individual architects, or it was focused on individual architects as these creative authors. I think one of the biggest changes in skyscraper scholarship in the last 30 years, let's say, is a transition towards looking at the tall building as a product of teamwork. I think scholars have different interests. Some look at teamwork within the architecture office itself, between architects and builders uh, and other contractors. Uh, we discussed briefly about the rise of the structural engineer as an independent professional. Uh, Gail Fenske has done wonderful work on Cass Gilbert and his engineer. Now, I personally think that it's important to be accurate in our history, so I think it's just a more accurate understanding of how these buildings were developed. The sole architect model, that's just um, not true. But I wonder if we think that looking, expanding the authors um, has also substantially changed how we view the history of the tall building, if it changes what we're looking for and the kinds of questions we're asking. Um. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I mean, that's really a fundamental change in, in skyscraper history scholarship. I mean, I'm not sure I can answer it in terms of the specificity of practice, but what I will say is that model um, that you're talking about is very much an art historical model um, where art historians are looking at these forms and using the same methods uh, that they've used to look at um, more discrete artworks, paintings, and sculpture. And so when you talk about the Chicago school, that's a term that's used in art history, the school of Vasari, the school of so-and-so. Um, and, you know, you could make the argument that even in those uh, situations, it, the works that you're discussing are not sole authored. They are works of teams of people directed perhaps by a, by a single practitioner. Um, but um, what's exciting about all the recent scholarship, I think, is to, is to move away from that art historical perspective. And, and you and, and others have really um, helped uh, move our discussion um, much more into urban history, economic history, and of course, technological history. Tom, in one of your, uh, just I'll just add one comment to my question. I remember you mentioned the, um, I forget the term you used, but you talk about the sort of culture of tall building development in Chicago, that there was um, there was a sort of world of people that were participated in the development of the skyscraper, and they shared ideas. They worked together. Um, it's just a very different model than you know Burnham and then Sullivan, and just sort of going architect to architect through time. Yeah, there. When you read through uh, Inland Architect, or you look at the the minutes of um, the Western Society of Architects, you get a real sense that they were collaborating, uh, even though they were competing for work. Uh, that that they got the sense that they had the sense that you know if they were sharing ideas and sharing expertise, that you know rising tide would lift all boats, and that is they got better and better as a discipline or as a set of disciplines uh, at, at this particular task, um, you know, it would sort of benefit everyone. Uh, Jenny was, was really one of the main protagonists uh, in that. And I think did a lot to create a culture that you know, probably wasn't unique to Chicago, but uh, very much flavored the, the, the discourse in Chicago as I think it, it maybe didn't happen quite so much in, uh, in New York or, or, or Philadelphia. Can I jump in here? Uh, 
Don, I was really impressed by those graphs, and I kind of ask you for a copy of those, um, which really underlined that the reason for all this activity in Chicago and New York was the uh, amazing increase in uh, uh, economic activity in the United States following the Civil War. In fact, it's obviously been called the American Industrial Revolution, which followed the British one, which would take place at a earlier time. And uh, this began to provide an environment and a demand. One of the things that I uh, came to the conclusion when I was writing that book was that the industry is not really an industry in economic terms. It's basically a service. We only build when we are asked and told to build, with the possible exception of the residential sector. And uh, it's the owners that are the ones that give us the uh, opportunity to do this. And so um, I think the other omission in any of this discussion has been much reference to how all these buildings were built. The process the, the, uh, of building, and uh, this was a period that saw the rise of the general contract. Uh, they were the only ones who could come along and were willing to take the risks of building, which the architects were not willing to accept. Some of the engineers were, but even there, they were not all that keen to give a firm uh, price for the work to be done. And so we saw the rise of the general contractor. There's one, before I finish, one interesting story about that, that everybody knows this name, George Fuller who uh, eventually rose to become the, probably the principal uh, builder in America in later times. Well, he was trained as an architect in Boston. And uh, Peabody and Stearns, does that sound right? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> and um, one of the buildings that he was uh, uh, working on was a union club in New York City that was built by the Norcross brothers, one of the very early versions of general contract. And uh, eventually he left uh, Boston and headed to Chicago, no doubt because of the uh, incredible activity that was going on there. Again, Don's slides uh, supported. And he, for some reasons that I don't quite understand, but he was offering himself as a masonry contractor. Now, this part of the story is one I desperately want to believe, but have not been able to validate. And that is that Tacoma, Tacoma building, which has appeared on a couple of slides, it's no longer, no longer stands there, was being developed by a Boston developer. And um, he was pretty fed up with this, uh, this process of building trade by trade. And uh, in any case, uh, Fuller, had uh, uh, sub uh, submitted a bid to do the masonry, the facade, the masonry facade. And in doing that, he had to collaborate with the, uh, the framework contractor, subcontractor, and they eventually decided, well, we'll put in a joint bid for the, for the seal framework and the, what well, eventually became a kind of curtain wall facade. And from that, the Boston guys turned to him and said, why don't you take the contract for the whole building? <laughs> and he begins life as a general contract. And the other interesting thing about Fuller is that he developed a new approach to contracting for these large scale buildings that is now uh, very common and became very common uh, at this time as well, which was basically the construction management for a fee he would quote a fee to the builder, to the developers, uh, uh, probably a lump sum, perhaps a percentage. He'd give them a rough estimate and he'd said, we'll do all the rest of the work on a cost plus basis. And um, this became enormously popular. Why? Because the developers could, be guild, could, be, could begin construction until all the designs were complete. And they loved that because they'd get the building completed, cash flow coming in. And uh, so Fuller became uh, very famous for that uh, cost plus contracts, uh, construction management contracts. Brian, I'd like to 
Um, just, just, whoa. I'd like, Brian, I'd like to continue uh, your thought there. Um, it, it, looking at you know who's actually building the buildings and how they're being built, uh, I, I mentioned in passing that a lot of the engineers had, uh, who went into building steel frame skyscrapers had worked at places like American Bridge. American Bridge got into the business of building buildings. They were founded as a bridge company. That was their bread and butter for a long time. But then in the 20th century, they, they spent a lot of time building buildings. And they did so because the expertise they had with steel structure from building bridges was useful for building buildings. Um, so yeah, they, it, you have to look at who's, who's building things and how. Um, and I also, uh, Tom, I just want to mention a possible earlier use of skyscrapers. Uh, a skyscraper is a triangular sail above the royal sail on the royal mast. Um, it's the very, very top of a, of a tall ship. Um, and that at least is the early 1860s and probably earlier. So yeah. another possible oh, origin. For, for sure. Uh, maybe not in Chicago, but in ocean-generating <laughs> cities, uh, you're, I, I'm, I'm sure you're right. The American Bridge uh, transition, and American Bridge continues to be a, a major steel fabricator for skyscrapers well into the into the late 20th century. Uh, but you know, it's an example of a kind of a, like a latent technology, right? A, a, a solution that's waiting for problems to, to solve. Um, and the, the quick application of bridge technology to wind bracing, especially, uh, I think is one of the most dramatic kind of episodes of this era, right? Jenny talks about skyscraper frames as, you know, built like bridges, right? Like a, a, a cantilever bridge turned up on their end. And when you look at the early cross brace uh, structures, especially, they are literally, you know, bridges that are now cantilevered up out of the ground instead of uh, across a, a valley. I, I think that's a, a one like interesting area to think about uh, as, as we think about how the technology or how the expertise or how the knowledge disseminates through this particular subdiscipline is that a lot of it was out there floating around. Uh, and it, 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 it wasn't that it was invented necessarily the cleverness came in realizing that that solution could be applicable to other problems. I mean, with technology in general tends to be the need is already there and somehow being met badly. And then people yeah. say, wait, I can do something else. I mean, people were building tall buildings before they were using steel frame technology, right? So obviously steel frame technology is not a requisite, but it makes it, can, it, makes it much easier and faster and better. I couldn't resist popping in here uh, because I, I, I'd like to raise uh, a, a subject that Joanna referred to in our pre-call. It seems to follow from this idea of the general contractor and the organization of the site, because it seems to me we've, well, we've certainly talked about technology. We talked about architects. We have alluded to capitalism as the motivation for create, you know, creating um, both the what, demand and the supply of, uh, of tall buildings uh, and of commercial architecture. Uh, but the, but the org organization, whether it's in the building industry, the streamlining, the industrialization for um, Don, Don's terminology in, in his book. Uh, Joanna, you raised the issue as we were discussing um, earlier uh, that, that, the, that, organiz that organization is really a key way, a kind of a leg of the stool in order to bring together the forces of capital, the forces of technology, but then th whether we call it expertise or some kind of organization for efficiency, I wonder if you might elaborate a little bit on, on what you um, previously said. Sure, um, yeah, as Brian was talking, uh, it reminded me of another, um, story that's out there um, in Henry Erickson's book about um, his time as a contractor in Chicago that uh, according to him, the motivation for um, creating the early version of what we call a curtain wall was in fact to get around the problem of the power of the 
bricklayers. Um, the 1880s, there's a lot of industrial agitation. Um, bricklayers are going on strike, causing a lot of delays in building programs. And according to Ericsson, um, the architects are looking for a way to uh, some, I'm not going to say uh, repress, but evade the power that that um, those unions had um, by transferring to a different material. So in that case, um, in following up on what Don is saying, it's perhaps not the um, a question of adapting a new technology that's better, but um, leaving behind a technology that's causing you a lot of problems, which in that case is brick. Um, whether or not that story is true, I have no idea, but it's an interesting um, factor that we haven't yet considered um, the, the issue of labor and the radicalization of labor in the 1880s and the 1890s um, as, as really a motivator for um, adopting new technologies. When I think about the, you know, the, the skyscraper, a lot of times we've come to this point where it's like the race to the top. And it's reminiscent of the race to the moon and the technologies that resulted there. And you're right with the skyscraper. I mean, trying to figure out how to keep this thing standing, it's a challenging thing. And there's a lot that's resulted from that. So I'd be curious to hear. Um, I think one of the things we don't talk a lot about is what it takes to actually construct a skyscraper. So I'd be curious if you have any input on uh, from a safety standpoint for the building workers as they went taller. What are some of the things that we're doing now in the you know, 2022 that we weren't doing in, the, in these early, earlier times, but they were still able to construct tall buildings. Like, what are we doing now that's, uh, that's a little different or maybe the same? In terms of safety, everything. <laughs> you, we've all seen photographs of the old construction sites and they're wearing, they're wearing you know, uh, cheap suits, but they're wearing suits. Yeah. They're wearing, you know, shoes with leather soles. They're, they're wearing no hats, no fall protection, no gloves a lot of the time. Uh, it, it is insanely dangerous what they were doing. Most of them survived it, uh, you know, so you can't say it was, there was a lot of expertise in getting through the day like that. <laughs> yeah, most of them survived, but not all of them did. Not all of them. Uh, and and I, uh, I just presented a couple of weeks ago on, the, on Chicago's Prudential Building, which has always gotten sort of short shrift as, uh, you know, it was the first skyscraper in 20 years in Chicago, but Inland Steel a couple of years later often gets called you know, the Chicago's first because mm -hmm. the Prudential is so sort of backwards looking. But one thing that indisputably the Prudential did uh, before any others was uh, it implemented what we, I would think you would look back on now and think of as modern safety regulations. Uh, every worker had to have a hard hat. Uh, they kept track of accidents. Uh, there, the foreman, pointed to six incidents where he said hard hats saved lives where if it had been a pre-war building and they hadn't been wearing hard hats, they, they would have been fatalities. And the Prudential had no fatalities. They had estimated before that the, the general rule of thumb was that one construction worker per floor of construction would die during the process. And the Prudential was the first in Chicago to, to build at that kind of scale without a fatality. I think that's a, an area that um, you know is has not really been researched, and I think is is one that does kind of start to separate you know post-war and pre-war, and gives you a very very different sense of what the the cultures on the job site were like, uh, both in terms of the the power of labor and kind of protecting themselves, but also in terms of the general attitude toward you know what what you wanted out of a construction site and, and the fact that. Um, the, the life of a construction worker was worth a lot more in the 50s uh, than it was uh, in, the, in the early 20th century. Jared, just to sort of combine a couple of threads and, and your profession, uh, it, it occurs to me that uh, coffer dams and uh, caissons, which you know both play a huge role in Chicago and, a, and a, an important but smaller role in New York, were, were you know first used on bridges in the U.S. and uh, it's it's another piece of technology that goes into these buildings, particularly in Chicago, that was coming from elsewhere. Elsewhere again within the U.S. within the same profession, but a different portion of it. Well, what about um, riveting coming from the shipbuilding? Hmm. 
it's because the U.S. the U.S. was really backwards in terms of shipbuilding. I mean, we we did not build much compared to let's say the U.K. Um, and I don't know that here that's true. I think in the U.K. riveting really gets going in shipbuilding first and boilers as well. But uh, here I'm not so sure. They're just and again, shipyards in Chicago are for smaller. <laughs> We'll give you that one for sure. We'll give you that one. Yeah, you talked about the grain silos. That was, I mean, it feels like it was weeks ago. I think it was months ago. I talked about the grain silos. It's like, wait, those are heavy structures that are on the waterfront. We should be able to do something like that here. So um, it's just, it, it makes you think. Sometimes the solution is already there. You just have to modify it a bit. What are your thoughts on slenderness? We didn't talk a lot about that, but as we see, you know, towers now are much, you're still getting taller, but the lots are smaller. So we're ending up with, uh, that L over R is a lot more, <laughs> a lot more than the, than the uh, carpenter's rule, right? <laughs> we had we had talked about that in some of the the sort of the the pre uh, roundtable internal discussion, and it, it's I, I love that topic because it's a good one for New York. Um, New York's uh, real estate was more fragmented in ownership and had people who just were not going to sell. I mean, the the holdouts here. Are, some spectacularly famous craziness with that uh, and smaller blocks. I mean, so even if you could buy a whole block in New York or a whole block front, it would be smaller than a Chicago block front. Um, so we were sort of geared towards building on smaller lots. Uh, and uh, I, I have, and this is something I'm waiting to find an excuse where I can discuss this, where I can write this up. But there's a whole species of skyscraper, subspecies of skyscraper in New York that simply doesn't exist anywhere else. And that's the row house sized skyscraper, the, the, the 20 foot or 22 foot wide building that's 14 stories tall. It, it's just they're bizarre buildings. Um, and keep in mind that until maybe 20 years ago, the most slender skyscraper in the US was the Gillander building, you know, from the 1890s. Uh, which was over 10, over 10 slenderness. Um, and just to put that in perspective, you know, the Empire State Building is seven and change. The World Trade, the World Trade Center is six and change. Um, 10 is a very slender building. Of course, now the, we, we have buildings going up over 20, but that's, that's using very, very different technology for the structure. Um, before we run out of time, let um, me pose a question to, to Tom and Dom about summary. Um, and then Alex, if you wanna take us on to uh, other topics that you've prepared, please do that. But um, again, we uh, have had in our preliminary discussions, me pressing for um, what, are, what, what are the takeaways um, other than it's complicated? How, is there something we can make some simple, simple enough as a narrative that it can be repeated by all of the people who are on this call and all of them who listen afterwards to say, ah, you know, that, that idea about history, about New York versus Chicago, uh, it, you know, is a, um, was discussed by these really smart people who talked about it a very long time, but at the end of the series, you know, this, this, is, this is what we could find about the two cities being either similar or different, maybe both, but, but what is that kind of um, simplified, not oversimplified, but simplified takeaway from what the two of you learned by um, hashing it out over, over uh, four and five sessions? No, that's that's the that's the right question, um, and we should let the audience know that, that Carol has kind of made fun of the two of us for answering. It's complicated to absolutely everything she's put uh, in front of us, so I I, I, I won't say that. I'll I'll um, re repeat something that we were talking about in the, the sort of pre-call though, which is to say that um, you know one thing that's been made very clear to me listening to Don and then you know preparing my own presentations is that. Um, you know, there are profound similarities, right? If you're at 50,000 feet and looking at skyscraper construction in this era in both cities, there's a lot that's very, very similar. They're trying to solve essentially the, the same problem, right? Machine for making the land pay. I'm, I'm glad Joanna brought that phrase up. That is the function 
right? And part of Adler's response to Sullivan was to say, if, if, if form follows function, every skyscraper looks the same, right? But it's the material conditions and the kind of local conditions, the soil in Chicago that makes those engineers and architects think lighter and more skeletal. It's the size of the lots. It's the you know, difference in kind of expectations for, for what a building would, would, uh, would look like. All of those kind of um, preconditions or, or the kind of material uh, environments or climates uh, around them lead to subtle but recognizable and important differences. And, and I guess I would argue that, you know, the skyscraper is one species, but there are all of these subspecies that have you know, slightly different beaks uh, or, you know, however you want to, to, to make the analogy. I was, I was actually going to point to your, uh, your Darwin drawings and say, that there, there it is right there. Um, just again, back to our discussion before 5.30. Uh, you've got different economic conditions, different social conditions, different regulatory conditions, um, different economic conditions. Uh, Chicago was a much more heavily industrial city than New York, and that means its economy functioned differently. Uh, just all of these things are different. So if you say that, every, that you have equally smart architects and engineers and equally smart contractors with the same materials and the same technology in both cities, they're going to come up with different answers um, just based on all of those external conditions being different. So it, the short version for me is that, is that you have, um, everything is primed in the 1880s for the skyscraper to develop and it develops differently in New York and Chicago based on the local, the local quirks of the two cities. Well, can, can we say then um, that one of the conclusions of uh, this continuing discussion and Joanna and, and Alex, I hope you chime in here as well because these, this is your period as well. Um, Joanna's book, 1890 in Chicago. Can we say that, that we um, agree that it's the 18, 80s um, and not the 1870s that start the tall building. Um, and I think we've already said why, but if I, if I pressed against that uh, and say, no, I think, we sh I think it's 1873, 1874 uh, with the first tall commercial buildings in New York that uh, are that, that contain space for rent rather than our headquarters or, or specifically built buildings for, co for companies rather than spec built, speculative um, construction uh, that, um, that enlarged in the vertical um, and in the um, expanded floor space, the urban real estate that I myself see as the definition of, of the skyscraper. So, for me, that's something that begins in the 1870s, irrespective of what is the structural system that is going to allow that, that to happen. So uh, do we, is there a consensus um, among you guys about the 1880s or you know, if not what was the first skyscraper, but when were the first skyscrapers? What, what do we say about that, about that decade, um, about the decade differences? Um, uh, Joanna, Alex, will you want to chime in? I'm kind of getting at it a little tangentially, Carol, but I'm really um, struck by um, Tom's research on the use of the term skyscraper. I mean, I'm very tempted to say there is no such thing as a skyscraper until we name it as a skyscraper. Right. And again, you can't identify that first naming either because it's, it's a little fluid. But um, something that we haven't talked about is the fact that the first naming was the term was very pejorative. It was meant to be um, a criticism of this type as something that has very negative impacts um, um, on the on the urban scape. You know, blocking out the sun, creating a lot of pollution. Um, so, it, what's interesting to me also is the moment where the word turns around and starts to become heroic, something to be celebrated, which happened quite quickly, probably by around 1900. Um, but uh, so alongside the kind of technical construction history, we can look at the cultural history of what that term meant. 
I have to chime in for just a moment because um, this takes me way back to my graduate school days. And the reason, I think a good deal of the reason <clears throat> that I wrote Form Follows Finance or that I took the approach that became Form Follows Finance is that is in those days in graduate school, everything was linguistic. Everything was, uh, was hermeneutic. Everything began with the word. So, you know, I, I objected to the idea that um, in the beginning was the word skyscraper and then aha, we have something that we're going to trace through time. So I don't object to your, your um, kind of cyclical uh, re reinvention of that argument, Joanna, at all. And it, it is important, but it makes me laugh. Um, that it's the very reason that, that um, I, I took the approach that I then um, have been haranguing uh, uh, people uh, with for um, more than uh, 25 years. Well, to answer your question, Carol, I think the 1880s are a critical decade, but I think it's essential to start the story before that, even maybe even before the Civil War, to look at the urban land market in lower Manhattan or in Chicago to look at the history of the office building. Uh, we know that all tall buildings are not office buildings, but the creation of these speculative office buildings, that was the main driver. Why, why are people building buildings for office workers in very specific areas of cities? I also think that's really important when we start to look at the global context of tall buildings. As we know, not all tall buildings are built out of steel um, and not all tall buildings are built in the United States. So I think that focusing on those sort of structural economic factors in tandem with the history of technology and architecture, uh, I just feel like that's a great guide that can take you like from this early history to the, you know, the big global more present history. Well, you're talking prehistoric history. I mean, we just, we just took the needle and just went back quite a bit, but you're right. If, if, if that infrastructure had to be in place for a skyscraper to be a thing, then we go back pretty far. We go back pretty far. It's an interesting uh, the, question. The, the, the game is that you have, to, you have to set it up so that you don't end up with the, the kind of British historian bringing up the Crystal Palace and then the Italian historian bringing up Roman Insula. And you know, this happens over and over again. I think the way I'd answer your question, Carol, is that it's a, you know, it's a, a kind of continuum, right? So it's a it's a, a bar that goes from, you know, very, very light shade in the 1860s to one where you start to notice it a little bit in the 1870s and then finally kind of full strength by the 1880s. And I think Alexander's point is absolutely right, that it, it depends on, you know, what you need to tell the story, I guess. And so I think that, the, you know, the development of the office is important, just like British mill construction is important. Um, it's hard for me to, 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 to do this with students without starting in the 18th century. Um, I, th I think for people who've got a little bit more background, I would say, you know, I mean, for me, 1871, that's like, that's where everything in Chicago seems to start. Um, but I think that you need that kind of running start to get at the, the how the key developments fit into context in the, in the 1880s, which is when the, the bulk of the story certainly happens. Actually, I... I asked both Don and, and Tom in an email or earlier today or yesterday, uh, because 1871 is the date on the cover of each of their books as the beginning of the history. And for, I mean, Tom, you didn't say why 1871. I, I assume it's the, um, the Chicago fire yeah. as the beginning. But Don, you had a completely different um, reason. It was fire related, but, but not a conflagration. Well, what I, I, it's why did things change? I mean, that, that's something I did try to get at in the book. What, people were people were happily building cities without skyscrapers. People were happy with, for the most part, with the way they were building buildings. And if you look at buildings in the U.S. in 1870, so before the Chicago Fire, if you said brick and wood, you've just described probably 95 percent of them. Uh, if you said brick, wood, and cast iron, you've probably now described about 99% of them. Um, I'm talking all buildings everywhere. So that, that, is, that is what people were, built, were building. They weren't worried about necessarily, there wasn't necessarily a reason to change. And what happens is you've got the Chicago fire in 1871, 
And in some ways, the, the one that isn't discussed but might be more important is the Boston fire the following year, much smaller area, many fewer people dead, many fewer buildings damaged, um, but it cost the insurance companies more than the Chicago fire. Most of the buildings that burned down in Chicago were small wood frame buildings, most of them houses. They weren't insured, and except for the people whose lives were affected, nobody cared, right? The, if, your, if your building burned down, it was a tragedy. But to the, the, the insurance companies, they didn't insure the building, it didn't exist. What burned in Boston was the center of a densely built commercial city. Uh, and the insurance companies paid an enormous amount on both the buildings and the content of the buildings. And th their basic reaction was, we cannot have this happen again. Two years in a row, we've had to pay. And the second was worse than the first. We have to start doing something. And you can trace the beginning of the underwriter's laboratory to that era. You can trace the beginning of insurance companies saying, we have to get involved with building regulation to that era. It, we're not just going to play statistics on what people are building, we're going to try to actively change what people are building because it will benefit us economically. And really from, from the early 1870s, starting 1872 after the Boston fire, to some extent starting even after the Chicago fire, um, you get the insurance companies actively pushing things like terracotta tile arch floors as a fireproof floor. Um, changing the rates uh, on buildings with mansard roofs, which were a big factor in the Boston fire. Um, to, try, to some extent, insurance companies killed off the second empire style because they were charging much more, much higher rates on buildings with mansard roofs. Um, and that is something completely different. This is something new. It's an outside influence on the building design and construction world uh, that people in design and construction had no control over. This was, this was the money saying, you gotta do something different. And to me, yes, you can, you can trace back, you can trace back at the very least to the, to the 18th century and, and British mills. You can trace back further if you want to. Um, but the, the moment in the US that creates the skyscraper for me begins with um, an economic influence saying, you have to change the way you build because we, the people with money, care about it. And that's, that's why I say 1871. I'll just note as an architectural historian, if you were schooled in any of the traditional textbook, the 1871 means to you in New York, the equitable building, the first equitable building. Uh, and why was that called the first skyscraper or proto skyscraper by Winston Weissman, the, the great um, historian, uh, architectural historian of the, the, the first New York school? Uh, because it was the first elevator office building, which is kind of odd because there were elevator hotel buildings 20 years before. So elevators had been incorporated into commercial buildings. They just happened to be hotels rather than office buildings. So I've always discounted the, the first equitable building as a kind of a phony, phony version of, of um, a tall building because it was Sure, it was not as tall as it was wide ultimately, and see, taller than a cube seems to me a, a bare minimum for beginning to, to use the terminology skyscraper. Uh, but leaving that aside, because I don't want to circle back to architectural history as being the kind of complete sphere of our understanding of this of this building type, as this series has has shown and and done, especially as as is, is always been combative about an architectural um, privileging uh, in the history of the skyscraper. And, you know, my hat's off to him absolutely for, you know, keeping us honest on all those things. But in all of these answers that everyone has been giving, giving that it's complicated it is, is really the kind of conjunction and the crosswinds of so many other forces, whether it's the force of capitalism, whether it's the force of organization and industrialization and work, whether it's, you know, railroads, um, uh, all, all of these things have really changed the nature of cities and of making things and the expertise that one brings and then the efficiency that is part, um, I think, of the, of the modern world. So um, because we are closing in on our very last moments, um, let me just um, ask everybody where you think the, the most 
fruitful questions are for kind of our, our next step in, in thinking about this. Are there, are there any thoughts? Um, we've already said, you know, beyond New York and Chicago, yes, and, and we wanna do that. And in, in part, tonight's program was really uh, the kind of um, balancing or perhaps pushback to just going elsewhere to tell more stories about other cities. We wanted to think about what is it, what is the nature of change? How, how does change happen? And then measure other cities against that, that, that kind of explanation, that standard, uh, rather than just elaborate on the particularities of place. Although we certainly um, talked about how place really matters. Uh, but you know what? So what? What are other questions? Um, what is your your best idea, Joanna, of other questions that that scholars should ask, or that you know any any writers or, or explainers um, from other disciplines should should bring to this question um, about uh, uh, about whether it's construction history or when and why do things happen. Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, obviously my um, first instinct, instinct is to talk about broadening the focus, you know, I'm having the privilege of beaming in from a very, very long way away from where you are and from this perspective, um, it does seem like a kind of insular conversation to talk about these two, uh, you know, cities uh, not even representing the whole of the US. So that's my first question. Um, Alex already uh, raised that. I mean, I, I have to bring up the question that I always get whenever I give any kind of lecture about skyscraper history to students, and it's a good question that I can never really answer, and it's not about history, it's about the future. They always ask me, is, is the skyscraper dead? Is this, is this a part of history that we're now moving beyond, or, or is it, um, do you see it having an ongoing value and cultural meaning and if, I can't answer that question but it's a really good one because if you think of the whole history of um, architecture maybe you know in 500 years the skyscraper will be a tiny blip that hardly anybody ever remembers I don't know that's that's really it's, it's interesting you say it that way because you know one of the things about skyscrapers I've seen in my 20 years or whatever it's like it's the tallest building until the taller one is built afterwards. Mm -hmm. That taller one is usually being designed when the tallest is being constructed. So it's it's fascinating. It's like, where do you stop, right? Uh, one question that I had is, you know, this notion of the skyscraper making the ground pay, right? And making the land pay. I wonder from a sustainability standpoint, how much you know, we've talked about it, right? We've thought about it, but from an embodied carbon standpoint, right? Skyscraper. I don't want to say is it a good thing, is it a bad thing, but you know, if you want to be controversial and think about things, you talk about that. Well, you know, what is it doing for the planet? You know, interesting notion. I mean, the argument is that uh, tall buildings or, or big buildings use less energy per capita than okay. smaller buildings. Um, obviously, when you get to the tallest buildings, that may not be true, right? The the the, the extreme the extreme buildings are are. Uh, very resource intensive to build, not necessarily to operate, but definitely to build. Um, but if you look at, uh, I, I mean, if, if we're talking about 500 years from now, anything could be true. If we're talking about 50 years from now, um, denser development tends to be more energy efficient. So there's something to be said there for uh, for big buildings. Well, and this, this yep. And the skyscraper's obituary has been written many, many, many times, uh, and it, it, it's it's always always come back. So, yeah, Alex, last thoughts. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm. I think there's work to do on the labor history, on the building trades, on skyscrapers, and I think the global history is very interesting. The skyscraper was an American building type in its emergence. There's no doubt about that. The rest of the world perceived it that way. But at some point, it was no longer an American building type. It became like the English language, like a world language. And the innovation and, you know, the, the, the development started to, to originate in different parts of the world. Um, and I don't really have a real good sense of the sort of dynamic global history of the skyscraper. And I think that's a great topic. Uh, Brian, you want to um, close us down with the, with the last thought? 
No, the, the only uh, only thing I would like to say is is uh, really a commercial, if you wish, and that is, uh, you know, uh, we formed uh, Tom and Don and myself and a few others formed back in two thousand and eight, the Construction History Society of America, and uh, this is a wonderful forum for dealing with every aspect of what we've been talking about here. Uh, and, and including some side issues that are interrelated with it. And I, I, did, I would recommend people to go to the website, Construction History of America, and, uh, and, and, and join. It's a wonderful forum for the interchange of uh, studying history in the widest possible sense. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks to you all for getting a little feedback. Thanks to you all for, uh, for being with us tonight and all of those other nights. Um, we're really in your debt for um, the, uh, the, the intelligence and the good humor and uh, the uh, tenacity that you bring to, to the topic um, of construction history. We will certainly revisit it many more times, um, especially to Tom and Don, but also Joanna, Alex, and Brian and Jared um, for tonight and, and throughout. We will return um, to the topic. In fact, sustainability is going to be our subject for the, um, for the fall semester. So people should return on our, to our website. Um, I will mention that on July 12th, uh, we have Jeffrey Richman is going to um, take us back to the uh, 1870s and the 1880s again for a uh, history of the Brooklyn Bridge and its construction. So there's more construction history at the Skyscraper Museum. Uh, but for now, and thanking you, I'm going to use the regular um, sign off for, um, for most of my emails, onward and upward. So see everybody next time and thanks so much. Thank you Everybody. all. Bye. Bye.